Thanks for joining us today. I am Pete Myers, uh, also known as Dr. Pete. I'm the marketing scientist for Moz. I work across the product team and the subject matter expert team. Uh, I want to talk to you today about brand authority. Now, brand authority is a metric and a tool we launched back at MozCon in August. But I want to talk to you today about a little bit about that, of course, but about the broader journey over really the last five years of how we got here what we've learned about brand, what we've learned about measuring brand, which is an imperfect thing to be sure, but that we think we're starting to get a handle on, what we can do with that now that we kind of have a number to put against it. But, you know, to begin with really, not only why brand is relevant to marketing itself, but why brand is extremely relevant to search marketing and to how Google works. And in ways I think we sometimes don't think a lot about you know we know that we want to rank for our brand and things like that and then we kind of just let it be what it is and float away uh and, and i want to try and get us to think about it in concrete terms and why it's important so we all know what this is right you know and and it attests very quickly to the power of brand but the thing about it is that we also as important as this is in the real world right we also kind of take it for granted right it's really easy to miss the influence brands have on us, miss the influence our brands have on others, because it's always there. It's so ubiquitous. It's so part of how we make decisions and you know the information we pass on the people and the way we refer things and the way we recommend products, services, what have you, the way we look for things that I don't think we give it the attention that we should sometimes. I think we're also a little hand wavy, right? You know, we, we kind of go, oh, brand, yeah, brand is important and we have to build our brands and we have to brand, 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 brand. Uh, and then we don't really do anything <laughs> or say anything. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm grateful I'm seeing people in the SEO community and, you know, the timing is great this year and last year talking more about what that means, talking about how to quantify it, talking about how we build brands. Um, and, and that's really nice to see because I think we're coming to some of those conclusions together that this isn't just sort of a vague marketing idea. This is a very specific thing that matters in the world. And because it matters in the world, it matters to Google. And I want to reiterate something you may have heard of, but this is a very important concept in Google search. Um, and this version is my version, but it goes like this. Someone in 2023 types in a search for Apple they almost definitely mean Apple the company. They don't mean Apple the fruit, mostly, even though we all know what that is, and we probably had one, you know, at least the people on the call here. Uh, they don't mean any of the many other interpretations like the Mother Love Bone album from the 90s. Most people want the company. And if this seems familiar, it's because it's really a ripoff of Google's own slide, this is directly from the search quality rater guidelines. And this is a concept that Google calls dominant interpretation. And I think we under, we under appreciate what it means. And so again, what Google's saying is that most people, when they type in Apple, mean the company. And if most people mean that in the real world, if that's the expectation that searchers arrive with, then we have to serve that expectation. Google has to serve that expectation because if they don't, then the results are wrong. That's how they view it. That's what the search rate of quality guidelines are saying. Now, how that it gets interpreted into the algorithm, how they measure that, you know, we're gonna get into some proxies for that. We don't entirely know, but we know it's so important that in the past even, we've seen situations where penalties were quickly removed because a very big brand wasn't ranking first. This isn't because you know, I think it's easy to go, well, Google's just playing favorites, right? They're paying ad dollars. They're doing this, that, the other thing. Okay. <laughs> you know, money talks to some degree. I do believe there's strong separation between organic and paid, uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. But I think what's critical to Google is that this really is a search quality problem, like problem fundamentally, right? If Apple isn't ranking first here, then something's wrong. The results aren't what people expect. And what I think we have to face as SEOs that maybe is a little scary is that even if Apple weren't doing the other things right that we say they have to do, you know, and, and obviously as a huge brand they are, but if their technical SEO wasn't up to spec, if they didn't have the right kind of content, if their tags weren't quite right and their, you know, schemas weren't all in place, if they didn't have the right links or some of their links were a little strange, that doesn't matter. 
<laughs> they still should be number one because that's how the world works and that's what Google has to model. So I really want to drill that into your head and I may feel like I'm overdoing it, but this is just a fundamentally important concept to search. Also, I think, you know, we all know over the last 10 years, there's been quite a dramatic shift in the diversity and the presence of SERP features. And so it's not just that Apple's coming up number one organic, right? Apple and all kinds of brands, and not even huge brands, but many medium-sized and smaller brands, get these additional signals. You know, so here's a search for Apple. What do we see right away? We see this number one position with expanded site links. Takes up a bunch of real estate. Underneath it, latest from Apple. That's not just a news result. That's only news about the company. We see this knowledge panel on the right talking about Apple as a company, giving information about their stock and their products, that Google understands Apple as an entity. Um, I'm not going to get deep into this. You may hear people say, well, brands are just entities. Um, I'll give you my short answer to that. Yes, brands are entities. No, brands are not just entities. You know, Apple and uh, Bob's Fish Market on the corner are both entities. Google understands that those are things. Google understands that I and Taylor Swift are both entities, <laughs> but we are not equal. Uh, it's uh, sad to say for myself, we are not equal in the world. Um, and Bob's Fish Market may be great, but they're not equal in the world to Apple. And so I think, yes, Google has this rich entity understanding, but they also know that some entities are bigger and more important and more searched for by people than others. And I definitely think Google can measure that. But what I want to get at here is just that even the SERP itself, you know, it's just dramatically different. This is a SERP that Apple owns. And we've seen this, you know, what happens underneath it is just dramatically reduced from a typical organic. Even in the AI search generative experience world that's coming, we can see that SG understands that Apple is a brand, right? It describes Apple as a brand. It lists store locations. It's giving information about the stock and the corporation, giving their LinkedIn profile. So, you know, I still am very skeptical about the rollout of SG, and I'm not going to get into that really today. But even as we move to this, think about what SGE is. Think about what LLMs do. They model the collective knowledge, the collective language corpus of the whole world. And so brands are naturally represented in that, right? Apple is talked about as a company, their products are talked about all the time across the web. And so even as we move to this, I actually think brands may become more important. You know, these models definitely understand the presence of large, important entities in the world. And so I don't think anything's going to change there. I want to show you one data point. This is from a CTR, an unpublished CTR study that turned out to be very complicated, <laughs> but it's still useful about five years ago that Russ Jones, uh, my late colleague, and I did. Uh, the blue line is a 10 blue links only, no SERP features, organic quick through rate curve. So it's a little higher than you might normally see, but basically in our data set, if there were no features, there were only 10 blue links, number one position got about a 45% CTR, Number two position was about 15%, and you know, a pretty standard CTR curve shape. A SERP with just site links in the number one position, just that one, what we might call a navigational, what we might call a brand feature, increased clicks in the number one to 80% and dropped the number two position to 5%. That's not in my mind, it's hard to prove this, because those extra two to four links are so important, they take up so much space. It's because Google is very good at determining what brands, what entities are big enough and important enough to need those. And so they know what searches people are definitely looking for a dominant interpretation, and they surface those links there. And that's bearing out, right? 80% click through in the number one position means everything underneath it, it doesn't really matter. That's not what people are looking for. Are looking for. So this is a very practical SEO problem. You know, I don't want you to think of this in kind of vague marketing terms. All right, so how do we start to quantify this, what this means? How do we start to piece it together? Well, it starts with something we do pretty well, you know, which is keywords and understanding the keyword space. And so for something like Apple, we have kind of the obvious stuff, right? That's easy, things with the word Apple in it. And they do that real well, right? Apple Pay, Apple Music, Apple Card, Apple Store, Apple TV. Yeah, they know how to get their name out there. But 
with a big brand, and we're going to get into this even with some smaller brands, there's also all these branded terms, you know, even if they're products or services, things that people give clear name recognition to, people will search for and, and know about, like iPhone and MacBook Pro and Safari and AirPods and iPad Mini and App Store and iWatch that don't have Apple in it at all. So in a perfect world to understand the keyword space of a brand, we want to make sure that we're doing all of that. And we can't take a simplistic approach of just going, oh, it's got the word Apple in it, which could mean a lot of things. We are lucky at Moz to have a couple of pieces of this puzzle that we're pretty good at. You know, one is that this is from Keyword Explorer, uh, keywords by site, we call it. We have this corpus of hundreds of millions of keywords that we track regularly. And, you know, for Apple, obviously it's not true for everybody, but just for Apple, we have 6 million keywords that we can look at, right? Um, and so a tremendous amount of data we can work with to start to look at the profile of these branded terms. And we also understand search volume pretty well. And so we can start to piece those together to quantify what this looks like. Um, <laughs> we spelled brand authority wrong in one of our documents. Okay, thank you. We will definitely uh, address that. Speaking of branded keywords. Uh, so in this case of Apple, you know, yes, we have Apple, the brand itself uh, at two and a half million searches a month. Certainly nothing to sneeze at. But you can see that these other things that we might think of as smaller, like Apple Store, or even a pretty long tail product term like iPhone 14 Pro Max, AirPods, Apple TV, just those five that we're adding up, we're looking at something like 7 million searches. So the profile of a brand, as we think about it from an SEO perspective, is much broader than the name itself, which I think is not only a thing we have to measure, but gives us some opportunity, gives us some space we don't always play around with, thinking about our products and services as brands, thinking about the way that drives traffic. And you know what? This works for all kinds of brands, which is a nice thing. We have data on many sites that rank for hundreds of thousands of keywords. And what I want to talk about today, because I think it's really interesting, because it's so new and has hit the public consciousness so fast, is OpenAI. And so in Keyword Explorer, we got about 35,000 keywords that rank for OpenAI. And we can start to piece this apart. I'm a, I have a little teaser in here for the big numbers. But, you know, the actual brand terms you might kind of look at and go, oh, that's pretty good, but not amazing. Uh, you know, start with something long tail like OpenAI GPT-3. OpenAI itself, about 11,000 a month, obviously has been growing over time. That's good. You know, it's not amazing. Dolly, the product, the image generation product, 45,000, four times the brand itself. And then we have this 15 million at the top. And I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about it because I think as we try to understand brand, it doesn't just challenge how we think of brand terms. It challenges how we think of what head terms, how we think of high volume terms. We are classically still in the mindset of thinking that the narrowest term is the one that generates the most traffic. And we know as SEOs that maybe that's not always an attractive term in terms of click through rate, in terms of conversion, in terms of you know actual engagement. But we still think, tend to think of it as, as being the most traffic, the narrowest one. And then as you add words, it gets smaller and smaller. That's frequently not true over the last couple, over well, the last few years. As people adopt natural language, as people learn to search more like a human, we're seeing much more complexity in that. And so I want to challenge some of those assumptions uh, in this next section. And I want to talk about how these brand keywords can drive traffic. So OpenAI, first example I'm going to give. What's interesting about it is even though the company has been around for a few years, most of us, and especially outside of uh, AI circles or outside of kind of techie search circles had never heard of them until December of 2022. Until a little over 10 months ago, we had no idea who they were. And then they launched ChatGPT, and that kind of launched then into not just technical sphere consciousness, but the entire public consciousness. So we're looking at less than a year that their brand has kind of burst onto the scene. And so if you're doing SEO for them, if you're thinking in typical SEO fashion, you might be thinking about the kind of broad keywords, the kind of head keywords that you might want to target that would also drag, you know, also drive, uh, drag, drive kind of longer tail phrases. And so you might start with something like AI products, right? That, that seems like something you can compete in. It's not too narrow. And okay, you know, we're looking at about 2000 searches. It's okay, uh, not terribly exciting. 
OpenAI itself, as we already talked about, we're running around 11,000. So, you know, already the brand is kind of exceeding these longer tail phrases individually. Obviously, the concept of the long tail and thousands of things you rank for is still incredibly important and adds up to a lot. Chatbot. That seems pretty head termish, right? You know, that's definitely in the chunky middle, which is a terrible phrase that we use. Uh, but, you know, coming up on something that you think would be high volume and really right in the same ballpark as OpenAI itself. Dolly, we talked about about 4X, both of those. Chat. You're not going to get more narrow <laughs> than chat. And hey, this is great. Uh, 122,000, nothing to sneeze at to be sure. But here's what's interesting. ChatGBT with the space, ChatGBT without a space. There's probably some overlap here in the way we count search volume. But all told, something in the realm of 10 to 15 million searches a month. Just massively outweighing what we would think of as head terms. And especially chat, where we might think, well, chat's broader than ChatGPT, right? You know, chat's a bigger bucket, and ChatGPT is part of that. No. That's a, a way of simplifying things that has been useful for us in the past, but that is often wrong. Because people aren't looking for the word chat. Chat is kind of a vague thing to say. It's a, it's not, it doesn't really have clear intent. People are looking for the brand. They know of the brand. And what's interesting here, and I know this is an extreme example, you know, and I'm going to get into one that's maybe a little more down to earth and get into how this affects uh, smaller brands. I see some con some questions about that already. But just to show you that, you know, compared to even what they might think of as the most attractive head term, their brand terms are dwarfing that, are just driving their entire SEO process. And this is traffic that didn't exist a year ago. This is not them going to compete for things that drive 15 million searches. They created 15 million searches out of thin air. That's amazing. You know, and that's the thing I don't think we think about enough. But I also want to say that even these head terms that we see as so attractive just have a very different profile, right? Like ranking number two for chat. Okay, you've got Google Chat in the first position, Google Play in the third position, the dictionary in the fourth position, and a knowledge panel that's just about online chat. And Google is kind of saying, people don't know what they want when they type this. And so being in the number two position for this isn't that exciting. You know, it's nice on paper, and we can take whatever percentage of that 120,000, but what are we really driving here? Are we really driving the kind of people who will use our product and convert? Whereas that 15 million looks like this. We've got expanded site links in the first position. Google is answering whatever question I just asked it. <laughs> Thank you, Google. Uh, we've got OpenAI uh, in actually double dipping here because they use a subfolder for ChatGPT. We've got a Wikipedia at the entry for the brand in number three, and we've got this knowledge panel on the right. So, you know, again, we're getting up into this 50, 70, 80% click through rate, as opposed to maybe the 10 or less for chat. And now that 15 million compared to the 100,000 is even a factor of three or four X and just, just an insane, almost incomprehensible difference in the amount of traffic they're driving that just was created from nothing, that didn't exist a year ago. All right, so how do we bring that a little more down to earth? Uh, maybe a, a brand that's a little more accessible. This is, I'm not gonna tell you what the brand is right away, but we're gonna get into kind of some same things, some brand terms and some kind of more traditional SEO terms. So this is a brand search for a product. The product is sold 3070 Ti. We got about 20,000 a month. That's really great for a product, sure. RTX 4090, again, a product around 50K range. GeForce 56K, now you're probably, if you're in tech, you probably have some idea what company I'm talking about. GPU, now that is about as much of a head term as you're going to get. And it's just a little over one product that this company sells. Graphics card. Like here, I mean, if, the, if I were this company and there were two keyword phrases that for vanity's sake or for my SEO reports I was going to go after, it would be these two. And yeah, those are good numbers, 
but compared even to the products, they're about equal to even these three products, which are very niche. And now, of course, we know the company name, NVIDIA, about 3X graphics card, and GeForce Now, their product with the largest search volume, you know, which is their cloud, I don't fully understand, is a cloud-based product, even more than NVIDIA. So between the two, we've got something like 450,000 searches a month, whereas graphics card and GPU total maybe 150,000. And so again, I just want you to think about you know, these are our classic terms that we would chase after and spend all this money on and all this time on. And yes, it matters. And yes, these drive traffic. And yes, this profile is going to look different for most of us, for smaller brands just starting out. But these are companies that have, in a way, completely jumped over the traditional SEO process, but driven real traffic that drives real SEO results. And that has almost no competition, right? You know, other people ranking for GeForce or for NVIDIA or for GeForce Now, they're almost irrelevant. And again, we look at a couple SERPs, this is graphics card. You're not going to get more of a head term. NVIDIA ranks number three, but they rank behind Best Buy and Newegg, right? They rank next to a bunch of shopping results. If you're looking to buy a graphics card and you don't just want to know what one is, you're more likely to go to these other sites. Being a number three probably has a 5% or less click-through rate unless they're specifically looking for the brand itself and you know they're going to find that on any of these other sites and these are trusted brands too obviously you know the same people who know what nvidia is probably or are more likely to know what best buy is geforce i don't even know why i drew the boxes <laughs> because it doesn't matter because everything above the fold belongs to them and so you know you're probably talking about something in the realm of a 90 percent click through rate. Right? if I had to guess. And they've just, they've not only created these this traffic, but they completely own it. And that is just an amazingly powerful thing that I don't want you to neglect. All right, so let's talk about the score itself, what we've done. Long story short, when we take these things that we're good at understanding, I both hopefully at Moz, but as SEOs, this keyword space, this branded keyword space, the brand signals that Google shows on SERPs as Google gets better and better at this, and they are pretty good at it, the search volume for those terms, we can squeeze all that stuff together and start to come up with a score. Um, and so back in August, we launched Brand Authority on Domain Overview. It is in the same philosophical vein as Domain Authority and Page Authority, obviously calculated very differently, the zero to 100 score. And so now we can start to quantify, you know, somebody like an Apple, they have a brand authority in 92, that makes sense. You know, we've put together a top 500 US brands, we're seeing numbers that make sense and we can start to quantify this. What's nice is because we base this on your rankings, we can do this for even mid-sized and smaller brands. You know, if you're very small, if you're regional, you may not see a score yet. That's not, uh, we're not trying to insult you. That's not meant to be judgmental. You know, this is really about whether people have heard of you, whether people are talking about you enough to drive some traffic nationally. It doesn't have to be very much. But, you know, here's Moz. Moz, obviously, we have been around a while. We do a lot of marketing. We spend a lot of money on content. We have a very high domain authority. Uh, but we're still measurable as a brand. You know, we have a brand authority of 56. People have heard of our brand. People have heard of our products, things like Keyword Explorer. And so we can start to piece that picture together. And so what's cool about brand authority, I hope, part of, is that you know, usually if you type in top brands, top 500 brands, whatever, you know, you're going to get the Fortune 1000, you're going to get the Fortune 500, you're going to get lists that are generated by income, by revenue, by profit, which truthfully isn't always a great, it correlates with brand, but it's not always really a measure of brand. Uh, <clears throat> but we can start to get a number for just about anybody, which I think changes what we can do. We also launched this first version of uh, competitive analysis, and this takes your results from true competitors. So Moz, we're coming back with Semrush, Search Engine Land, HubSpot, and charge them in a two by two of domain authority and brand authority. And I think this starts to create some interesting opportunities for us to think about where we're competing and where we should invest, you know, and where maybe our ROI would be best in a broader sense than kind of some of our narrower search space, and especially in a broader sense, than link building or, you know, some of the stuff that maybe we need to evolve past <laughs> or or do better and in more elegant ways. 
so I'm going to show you a few things, some analyses I did that are outside of product. You can look at this in product. Nice thing about domain overview is you can look at anyone's brand authority and domain authority. Uh, you know, it is a research tool. You don't have to be that company. And so you can start to do some of this analysis on your own. So I want to show you some patterns I think are interesting. So this is the same graph. It's just a little nicer. Uh, I just mocked this up in Excel. And here we have Moz and some of our primary competitors, Ahrefs, SEMrush, HubSpot, Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Land, our publication competitors, our content competitors. And we can immediately kind of see an interesting thing here. We can kind of see these three clusters that we wouldn't be able to see just on a domain authority dimension. And so we see that HubSpot is kind of beating all of us, and that's true. <laughs> you know, they are a general marketing tool that is well known in the broader marketing kind of CMO space, where maybe some of our search tools aren't. Then we see that Ahrefs and SEMrush and Moz are pretty tightly clustered and probably not a surprise to any of those three companies. Uh, we have a little, maybe a 10 point spread in domain authority, less than that, even seven or eight. And we're all kind of in a similar space of brand authority, right? Like which given our niche being fairly small is reasonably good score, but people within SEO have pretty much all heard of all three of us. And then we have the publications, which I think is interesting just because, and this is a, this is a challenge in brand and in brand authority, they have somewhat generic names, right? They have keyword names, search engine journal, search engine land, that are typically a little harder to brand. So this doesn't mean that less people know of them per se, but they're usually driving traffic by their content and not by their brand, because their brands aren't as distinct and recognizable. But it gives us a picture of who we're competing against in two dimensions and where we might move. And so I want to show you kind of two scenarios I've seen that I think can get us thinking a little differently. One is this kind of dual cluster approach. So let's say you're down here in this DAB cl BA cluster in the 50s-ish. Now they, aren't, they, are, they don't correlate. You know, you can definitely have a, a DA and BA that are mismatched and that's useful and interesting in many cases. But here, just an artificial scenario. And we got a second cluster of competitors that are certainly outperforming us and our group of three. If we only thought in terms of domain authority and moving in one dimension, or if we, now that we have it, only thought in terms of brand authority and moving in one dimension, moving away from our pack and into that other pack would take a tremendous amount of effort in a single dimension, right? It would take more money, more ROI, the lift would be harder to achieve than if we're moving, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, if we're moving in both dimensions. So one thing I want to challenge people to think about, and this is not easy. I don't have any easy answers for how to magically be a, an apple. <laughs> That's not going to happen. But if you can start to think about brand recognition, driving traffic, brand recognition, being an SEO factor, and something that brings people to, into search. And you can start moving that needle as you move domain authority, as you build your content, as you build your links, you know, as you build your equity on the web. It's going to be easier to outcompete people than if you're focused on any one dimension. Because the higher up you go in these, the more it costs to get to the next step, right? And especially in our models where moving from, say, 90 to 100 is uh, nearly impossible, right? Compared to moving from 0 to 10. They're just that's how they're shaped, you know, getting to be a Google, unachievable. But moving a few points in both directions may be very achievable and may give you better results and better ROI. I think what's also interesting is we see a ton of scenarios where because all your competitors are building content, all your competitors kind of have the SEO basics in place, all your competitors have a history and a link equity you get into DA ranges, and it doesn't have to be the 90s. It could be the 50s or 60s or 70s for your niche, where breaking out of your niche gets pretty difficult. And so we see a lot of scenarios with big brands where, big online brands, I should say, not brick and mortar, but online brands, where they're all in kind of a tight DA range, but there's a broad spectrum of brand recognition. And so in some cases, you may, if you're only looking at that one dimension, not seeing of the power of moving in the other one. So this is a scenario where it would make a lot more sense to try and build your brand in various ways and even branded content and content that promotes your brand that would move you faster against the competition than trying to increase your DA in a range where that's going to be extremely expensive. All right, this is a new idea. I realize that measuring this is new and we're still figuring out how to use it and how you should use it 
And I hope you'll join us in some of that journey. But, you know, step one is if we can put a number against this, we know what that apple is. But if we can start to measure it, we can start to compare ourselves. We can start to understand how we fit in our own niches, you know, how we compare to similar brands. And if we can quantify it, we can start to take action, which I think is interesting in and of itself. And we want to build tools around that. But I also want to challenge you with one final thought, which is this. I think sometimes we view search as beginning here. We view search as beginning at the SERP. Someone's typed in a keyword. We have a SERP. We're measuring what's the volume, where are we ranking, what's the click-through rate, what's the conversion, all these things down the funnel, which are great. That all matters. Absolutely. You want to know what you're selling. You want to know what money you're making. But this isn't where search starts. And this isn't where search starts. It doesn't start even with the keywords someone types in. It starts with the keywords in people's heads. It starts with the ideas we bring to search. And ultimately, brand is an idea that we bring to search. And it's an idea that sounds a little strange, but I don't mean this in a nefarious way. It's an idea that we can plant in other people's heads. And hopefully in a useful, positive way, right? If we if we build strong brands, we build amazing products, we brand them well, people come to search with that in their minds. And then we win already. <laughs> We've already won before anyone's typed anything. If we're just one of the people ranking for that generic term, then we have to share. Then we have to compete. Then we have to just be part of that pie. Whereas if we can drive how people approach search, if we can drive what's in their heads before they type anything, that is also SEO and tremendously powerful and changes the game for us. Couple quick things. Uh, this is the brand authority landing page, mouse.com slash brand dash authority. You can learn more about the score, how to get access to it. If you are a mouse for a customer, domain overview is the current product where we have access. You can enter any site, get your BA scores along with your uh, domain authority, page authority, other metrics and get that competitive comparison. It's kind of a V1. We're hoping to do more with that over the next few months. And then we have just relaunched today this uh, brand authority quiz, brand authority archetype, which is kind of fun. Our designers have done some great work on this, where you can enter a domain, get your, you get your brand authority, domain authority, and it kind of gives you a person that's kind of like a personality test for your site. And so you can start to understand the space you operate in. And, you know, it's for fun. I hope you play around with it and enjoy it. But it's also just a way of understanding this two-dimensional space in this richer space of where you compete. So I hope you'll try that out. Uh, again, we just relaunched that today. That's moss.com brand-authority-quiz. So I think that's about it for time for us. Again, uh, thank you for joining us. So thanks a lot, and I hope you'll join us next time.